Hello there. Welcome to Spoiler Peace Theater, the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Dave Riedel. My pronouns are he, him. I write and I talk about movies, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. My name is Evan Crean. My pronouns are he, him. I am co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. And my name is Megan Kearns. I write my pronouns are she, her. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network. I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and I'm a member of Gallica, the Society of LGBTQ Entertainment Critics. Yowza. I, I thought I'd do Woo-woo. that instead of, yes, you are. I, I like know. a yowza. Yeah, I like yowza. It's a good word. It's a good word. Not it used is. enough since the heyday of Guns N' Roses. So, um, I concur. I yeah, I don't remember which song it's on. Um, it's Mr. Brownstone. Okay. Anyway. Great song. <laughs> great song. <laughs> so great. Any spray. We have a couple of movies to talk about tonight. But before we do that, I wanted to mention over on our Patreon, we are talking about the new Hallmark movie, Hanukkah on Rye. It's it's a love story. Well, it's a Hallmark movie. <laughs> so you know what it is. <laughs> yeah. You know what kind of formula we're working with here. It's a patron's pick, and we had a lot of fun with it. We had a lot of fun talking about it. And uh, if you are a patron, please go and check that out. And uh, if you're not a patron, be- consider becoming a $5 patron, and then you'll have access to all of our extra stuff to vote in polls and all of our extra uh, episodes, of which there are about 300 at this point. I don't actually – we should count. I should count. Someone should count because there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a hoot. We had a lot of fun talking about that. And on this week's show, we have two movies. We have Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, and we have Sarah Polly's Women Talking. So uh, first, we're going to talk about The Fablemans. This is, um, well, I'll just read you the the one sentence, IMD beer. Growing up in post-World War II era Arizona, that's hard to say too, era Arizona. Young Sammy Fableman aspires to become a filmmaker as he reaches adolescence, but soon discovers a shattering family secret and explores how the power of films can help him see the truth. It's directed by Spielberg. It's written by Spielberg with Tony Kushner. It stars Michelle Williams, Paul Dano, Seth Rogen, Gabriel LaBelle is is young Sammy. Yeah. And so if you know anything about Steven Spielberg's life, and you probably do because he's talked about it a lot, you probably mm-hmm. kind of know what's going on in the Fablemans. <laughs> it, that's ex- that description is actually pretty good. It, it just follows, you know, Sammy from uh, the first movie that his parents take him to, which I think is the greatest show in, on earth. Is that what it is? Yes. Mm-hmm. And they pay special attention to the train crash scene, which um, I don't remember being as horrifying as it is. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, <laughs> this is really graphic and yep. just terrible. And it it traumatizes Sam, but I don't know if he, if in order to deal with the trauma or whatever, he's fascinated by uh, recreating the film, uh, the the train crash, and you know filming it if he can. Actually, he doesn't have a, a an eight millimeter camera at that point, but he's obsessed with recreating the train crash um, from the movie, and mm-hmm. so eventually. His mother, I think, gets him an eight millimeter camera and he starts making these movies with his friends. And, you know, he even makes a World War II movie just like Steven Spielberg did with, you know, on eight millimeter. And then they, his dad, who was a big swinging dick at um, GE, uh, and I can't remember if he goes to California as part of GE or if he moves to a different company or not. I think to IBM. I think he goes to IBM. IBM. Which is very similar to Steven Spielberg's, you know, father's path. Um, They moved to Southern California. At this point, he's, Sammy's in high school and he's got three younger sisters. His parents' marriage is falling apart because mom, Michelle Williams, has fallen in love with Paul Dano, dad's best friend, Seth Rogen, um, which Sammy, of course, has found out because he saw them canoodling during a camping trip. And, you know, when he was editing his film, that's when he saw it and he's like, gross. And um, <laughs> he didn't say that. But I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I like that you're his internal monologue. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, Gross. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, it was and, more like internal scream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> scream into the void. Yeah. And Very Michelle true. Williams is, uh, you know, she she gives him a whack on the back when he confronts her about it. And um, 
but he actually doesn't because he doesn't want to tell his sisters. So it's like this, he, it's like this hush thing. He's just being, you know, quote, disrespectful, unquote. And, um, he's like, look, I know about you and Benny. And she's like, uh, shit, you know? (laughs) So then mom and dad's divorce is on the rocks. Sammy experiences true horrific anti-Semitism at bullying at his high school. Mom and dad split up. Mom and the girls go back to Arizona and it, you learn from like a photograph later um, that mom and Benny got together and Sam goes to college against his dad's wishes, becomes, you know, tries to do filmmaking. And uh, the movie ends with <laughs> Sam meeting David Lynch as John Ford, who tells him how to film horizons correctly. And that's mm-hmm. how you're going to make a good shot. And then the movie ends with an in-joke as the camera tilts up to put the horizon in a particular place as opposed to in the middle of the shot where it's never supposed to be. Right. So, And then it pans down to, to put right. it underneath. Right. So that's the Fablemans. Everyone's kind of been falling all over themselves to say how much, not everyone. It seems like this movie is being met with a lot of accolades. How did you two feel about it? Don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> Megan, go ahead. Megan, about you? I was like, I have a tendency to talk over people, so hence why I sometimes hang back. <laughs> sure. Um, I, so I thought this was great. And it's funny because, Dave, you and I had talked about it last week off mic. Yeah. And um, like, it's interesting because I totally get you, and I know you're going to share them. <laughs> I'm preemptively revealing yeah. this. You're going to share what you're... Spoiler. Um, I know. Spoiler alert. We're spoiler piece. It's the place for it. But yeah. And I understand like why you might not be feeling like, like, why is everyone falling all over themselves over it? And, and I have to say, to be honest in, you know, the advent of full disclosure, it's not one of my favorite movies of the year. Having said that though, I do really like this and I Mm -hmm. enjoyed this. I love Steven Spielberg as a filmmaker. I'm, even when I'm not fully on board with his films, I always find something really fascinating or there's emotional resonance or there's something really striking. There's always something that I can latch on to if I'm not on board for the whole ride, which I often am. And it's it's really fascinating because Steven Spielberg has been making films about his childhood for decades. Like this, his parents' yeah. divorce and their marriage really impacted him severely. And so mm-hmm. many of the films that he's made is in reaction to a reflection of that. So to see a semi autobiographical film, which I know it says it's semi autobiographical, but like when I started looking into, like, oh, did that happen? Did that happen? Yeah, like almost all the things happened. Um, like down to like him being an Eagle Scout and the War War Two movie he made was so he could get his Eagle Scout and the first film he made when he was twelve was about a train crash and you know and yes he did really meet um you John know Ford. Uh, John Ford thank you I don't know why I wanted to say John Houston um, he really did meet John Ford who told him about the Horizon you know and so it's really it, I find that interesting. I think what's really interesting about this is something that I haven't seen quite as many people talk about, which is so many people are talking about this as a love letter to filmmaking and to cinema, which it is. But the film critic Willow Caitlin McClay had a great piece. Um, A lot of it's behind her Patreon paywall, so I only got to read parts of it. But she had a great piece of what I did read about film as a coping mechanism and how Sammy uses it as a way to deal with the difficulties at home. And I think that's really the heart of this film. That's really what it's about. And I think when you look at it from through that lens, I I found that a much more, like when I thought about it and thought about it that way, and then when I read her piece, I was like, oh yeah, that seems for me to come together much more powerfully and to be a much more compelling element of this film. Um, Having said that, I love Michelle Williams. I think she's great. I always love her. As soon as I saw Seth Rogen in this, I'm like, oh, they're going to have an affair because they have great chemistry together because the two of them were fantastic together in Sarah Pauly's film, Take This Waltz. And I was like, oh, lo and behold, yes, they do have an affair together. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think Paul Dano is correct for this role. I think he's miscast. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of ours who said that, you know, he kind of fits the very mannered character that Sammy's father is. And I agree in theory, but I just, I don't think Paul Dano is the correct person for this. Having said that, I don't think he's bad. I just, it didn't work for me. But Michelle Williams' performance for me 
was heartbreaking because it's very clear that she is unhappy and that she wants to be happy, um, obviously. And so there's something very sad about her performance. Having said that, I've also seen criticisms, which I think are valid about how do we always have to have someone who's artistic, who's a woman, seem kind of unhinged and like to be like, you know, chaotic. Like, why does she have a monkey and like whatnot? Mm -hmm. So I think those are valid criticisms. The monkey. Jesus. The monkey. Yeah. The monkey pops up and then disappears. <laughs> we never see the monkey was again. That monkey? Was that real? Did so that weird. really happen? Did his mom have a pet monkey? I don't know. That's a good question. That I don't know. His name um, was Klaus. <laughs> <laughs> good question. But yeah, but I mean, I think that's a valid criticism of the character, but I think Michelle Williams does a great job with her performance in imbuing the character with some depth and sadness. So overall, I liked this. I think it's got some great themes um, that it's exploring. So yeah. Okay, Evan, how about you? I mean, I'm probably just going to echo a lot of what you were saying, Megan. It's um, Ooh, thanks, Evan. <laughs> it's it, it's a it's a solid movie for me. It didn't blow me away. I really love Spielberg. He's one of my favorite filmmakers, and I thought this was solid. Like, I really enjoyed watching it. I found it a little bit slow in places, but I think Michelle Williams is great in it. I think Gabriel LaBelle is great in it as, as Sammy, and I think especially when they get to the part where he's like college age he like really looks like a young spielberg like with the, with his like hairstyle and everything yeah it is a really i think what i responded to the most was its love letter to filmmaking and one of the things that was really fascinating was watching him learn film technique but also think of interesting ideas and ways that he could create effects like when he's a kid and he realizes he can punch holes in the film to make it look like there's gunfire. I thought that was really clever and interesting to see. And I enjoyed watching his character make the movies as much as I also later enjoyed watching those movies when they were cut together, like the world war two film to see how he was already thinking like a director and he gets like a great performance out of the, like a high school age kid, you know, he gets this yeah. great emotional nuanced performance out of this guy who is who's realizing that his entire you know tr you know platoon is dead and he's the last survivor and so i really enjoyed that aspect of the movie the glimpse into filmmaking as a craft and it does it you know it feels like a genuine love letter it doesn't feel like a lot of oscar -y awards movies are about hollywood in a way that's just you know it's it can be exhausting where it's like hollywood just so loves itself and it loves you know making movies about making movies and and it's easy i feel like to get cynical about those kinds of movies when they come out around this time of year and so this movie has an earnestness to it that i really appreciate it's it's showing a love of film and filmmaking and like you said megan i think you know, it, it does show how his character uses it as a coping mechanism and how the escapism of both making and watching movies can really be important in someone's life when they're just dealing with really heavy stuff. And I know that Spielberg had joked in some interviews that when he was working with Tony Kushner on this, he should have Tony Kushner should have been charging him for therapy because yes. he was just pulling so much out of him on an emotional level. And it's, it's clear it's there. There is, there's a lot of emotion here in this film. There's a lot of personal feelings and you know, you, you, it's palpable. And so I, I like this. I didn't, I didn't love it. Um, I also was kind of interested to see Judd Hirsch's performance because I know a lot of people were talking Ooh. about that and saying like, Oh, it's like a career best. And I think he's great. I enjoy mm -hmm. him in the couple of scenes that he's in. Also didn't quite blow me away in the way that I was expecting based on how much people were raving about the performance. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think it's a career best, but it is a great no. cameo. Yeah. Judd Hirsch is always great. Like, and not to diminish his appearance here or his work, but he is. He's always great in everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I hate come to come on, down Dave. I know you've been waiting for it. Side. Well, <laughs> here's the thing: it. is I I didn't I don't really think that I dislike this. I just think, honestly, who gives a shit? 
that's oh. kind of how I feel. Oh, damn. It's like, ouch. <laughs> I think part of the problem I have with it is, uh, well, here, this is maybe emblematic of how I feel about this. I spent a good chunk of this movie thinking to myself, is the Fableman supposed to be like Fable or is it supposed to be like fabulous? I mean, I like, like Fable. You know, what is that? Yeah, n- right. But I mean, <laughs> fabulous sounds better, you know, as like an idea, but I think anyway. Um, but I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I, I, there is at some point I'm like, I shouldn't be thinking about this. I should be more invested in these people. <laughs> um, That's a fair point. <laughs> and I, I think a big part of the problem, a big part of the problem for this is I think just Paul Dano is just really miscast. Just, I think his performance mm-hmm. is bad. Like, oh. I, I don't I don't think that it's okay. I think it's bad. I think it's a bad performance. I didn't believe him for a minute. I thought Gabriel LaBelle was really... He was really great in some scenes, and he was just wretched in others. It was kind of, I was kind of amazed by how he could like be so good for, in one scene and just terrible in the next. Um, and I don't know if that's because he's a young actor without much experience. I don't know if that's because parts of the screenplay work better than other parts of the screenplay. I don't know what it is. Um, I do agree with you, Megan, that Michelle Williams is great. I think that her character is kind of like, Oh, you know, yeah, no. kind of, I mean, problem's not the right word, but it's just kind of like, you know, I've seen this before and you're not doing anything new with it. And if this is what your mother was like, and this is the choice you made fine, but you know, for dramatic purposes, if you're going to dramatize your life, well, I don't want, and you're one of the greatest dramatists in film history, why don't you take it in a direction we haven't seen? And I just felt like the the stuff that really worked for me though was as both of you said the filmmaking as you know catharsis or or whatever and the truly horrifying high school experience sam has at the hands of those just fucking horrible anti-semitic anti-jewish bullies i mean that yeah some of that stuff is genuinely frightening and it's also it's all heartbreaking but some of it's truly Mm -hmm. like you fear for Sam that like that, especially the skinny kid whose name I can't remember is like gonna, you know, like break his arm, like just gonna like jump out of the bushes one day with a bat. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. And, and then there's that other, like the jock pretty boy who doesn't really dislike Sam, but he also just is, he's just kind of a jock asshole and then, you know, of course, you find out later that he's a little more sensitive than that. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, but you spent so much time being an asshole. I mean, uh, just, and mm-hmm. hey, kids, I'm sure in that time period, all 18-year-olds are weird in some way. <laughs> and I'm sure in that time period, you know, you had more license to be a douchebag. But I think that there there was a thing in that character, the the, the kind of like duality of the bully to be like not bullying you one moment and to be almost sympathetic to you the next. It was, it was like really uncomfortable in the way that like I, I saw that play out in high school in particular with some kids, but overall, Oh, I thought Seth Rogen was very good too. Agreed. But overall, I just think, eh, you know, I think part of it is also because, you know, you know, I know so much of this about Steven Spielberg. I know about, him making films as a child and as a teenager. And I know because he's spoken not at length, but he has spoken about the horrific anti-Semitism that he and his sisters faced. And he has spoken about not at length, but he has been pretty candid about his parents' divorce and how that's, you know, was a, uh, a big moment in his life. And you can see it, especially in his early films uh, in ET, like oh, yeah. so many broken families mm-hmm. in his late seventies, early encounter. 80s. Stuff. Close encounters. Close yeah. encounters. Exactly. Emotionally distant dads. He really knows how to nail that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, does. that's Richard Dreyfus <laughs> in, in oh, close encounters to a T the emotionally yeah. distant dad, you know? Um, so I just feel like a lot of this, I feel like is a retread. I, uh, maybe that's what it is. I just feel like I know this. And if you're not, and if you're not going to cast, you know, if you're not going to coast a better performance out of Paul Dano, who can be dynamic and wonderful, you know, I just don't know what the fuck I'm looking at. So, sorry to disagree with you two so strongly about it, but <laughs> I don't think you need to apologize. <laughs> no, certainly not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean it, I actually don't disagree with a lot of what you're saying. I actually agree with a lot of it. I just don't. I don't feel as 
<laughs> vehement about it. And I also, it didn't, I think like the fact that I disliked Paul Dano's performance, I mean, I thought it was fine, I guess, you know, but I disliked his, him being cast. It didn't yeah. detract from the rest of the film. I almost like could bifurcate like his performance is over here and the rest of the film's over here. So I'm okay yeah. with it. You know? Maybe I should have tried that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe, but yeah, but I mean, I also shouldn't have to do that. So I also understand like why, you know, yeah. it didn't work for you. Um, I do think it's interesting. Something you said though, Dave, that I think is really interesting when you're like, who gives a shit? And I think that, and I know you're being, you know, kind of cheeky and funny, but it is a very fair question. Like, why do we care? Why as an audience should we care? And it is a question that comes up so often because so many, so many writers, so many filmmakers make, make art about making art and why should mm -hmm. we care? And I think that is a really interesting angle. And I don't know if it's something that we're going to answer right here, right now, but I think, I think this film has enough good in it to warrant itself being made. I mean, I think the fact that it's about a Jewish family and, you know, we talked about this on Patreon, Evan, you talked about this, about how there are like no holiday movies or almost no holiday movies about Hanukkah or about Jewish people. So I think whenever we get more Jewish characters, that in and of itself is a great thing and to see, and especially, unfortunately, to see anti-Semitism when there is still so much anti-Semitism rampant nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think... And like I said, I think what what does set this film apart is film as catharsis. I kind of wish it dug in a bit more to it, um, sure. but maybe that would be too obvious. Like maybe maybe the fact that it's more subtle about it, maybe that actually is a boon for it. I don't know. But I think that is, I think that facet of it, the fact of being Jewish, the Jewish identity, dealing with anti-Semitism and, you know, what it's like to have a parent who's an artist and another parent who's not. I think that's kind of interesting. And also film is catharsis. Yeah. I think there's also kind of an underlying theme of like critique of machoism and like, mm. uh, yes, yeah. like, Definitely. like particularly I was thinking about it when you two were talking about the, the bullies and how it really shows them to be such like hollow, sad people who feel like they need to put on this front. And the one guy in particular is a lot more sensitive underneath that, but he feels like he has to be someone else. And in contrast to that, you see Sam throughout the movie kind of going at his own pace and his own way, which is a kinder, gentler kind of, style of masculinity which i think is also he sees that in both his his father and you know his father's best friend of being a kind of like different kind of more thoughtful kind of guy and not the like shitty macho kind of dude mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. i think that's a great point yeah i i guess part of i, I mean until you get to the high school stuff i feel like this movie doesn't really have very high stakes um, maybe that's because I've seen so many movies about families breaking down, but until you get to, you know, Sammy's life it, to me felt like it might actually be in danger. I just kind of felt like, you know, Paul Dano's character. I don't remember what the dad's name is. The dad, dad talks about Bert. like, Oh, Sammy, this is a great Bert. Thanks. <laughs> Bert, um, talks, Oh, this is a great hobby, but you'll go and you'll do this. But there's like, and Spielberg has talked about like the 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 way his he and his father really butted heads over his future when he was getting serious about filmmaking and i feel like they touch on that here but i don't believe any of it because there's like a moment when you know paul dano's like well you know you'll go and you'll do the, the you'll make movies and then you'll go and i don't know what he tells spielberg he's gonna yeah. do or sam like he's a gonna mathematician or something yeah he, he is a very like technical an engineer then you'll be an engineer yeah and then but then it, it just kind of comes and goes and it's like uh, where's the dramatic tension here like th they do have a scene where they're um kind of at each other's throats sam and his dad but it's more about um what has happened to the family as a unit as opposed to Sam as an individual after their move from Arizona to California. And it's fine. I still don't think Paul Dano is very believable in it, but um, it is good to have that moment at least where there's like some actual tension between the two of them. But I feel like uh, maybe this is what it is overall. You know, the Fablemans has, it's such a clear through line of where it begins and where it's going to end that I'm just kind of like, eh, 
dramatic tension, whatever. Mom's got a monkey, you know? <laughs> Mom's quirky because she's yeah. got a monkey. <laughs> Mom's, Mom's got monkey. bangs. That funky Mom monkey. is a manic pixie dream girl. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. Yeah, which um, is obnoxious. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so. I, like I said, I know I liked this. I know Evan liked this. But, Dave, I do, I do hear what you're saying because, like, when you look back on Spielberg films like Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., you know, films that are dealing with the degradation of the family unit or of suburbia or what have you. Yeah, those are much better films. Like they're much more powerful. They're much more tense. There's There are much higher stakes. Um, it is really interesting to see a director much later in his career kind of l- dealing with those same themes, but looking at it through a much more personal lens. And mm. I wonder if he had made this film 40 years ago, would it be different? Probably. Definitely. You know? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably a lot it more is, raw. Right. Like and I, but I, I, exactly. But that's the thing. I, I do think, and I wonder if for all three of us, I wonder if that's why we weren't blown away by it because it's lacking that rawness. Like it's there, it's touching yeah. on it, but it's almost not, it's almost like kind of backing away from the edge, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, I, also well, feel I mean, like- Oh, go ahead, Evan. I was going to say it's not quite rose-colored glasses looking at the past, but it right. certainly feels like the rougher edges have been kind of sanded down due to, you know, like a respect or a reverence for his parents. Yeah. Right. And I, I also think that Spielberg kind of has this habit of when he makes more personal movies. His personal movies don't land the way that his big swing and dick, that's the wrong thing to move because we talked about how he's not like a big, you know, macho dude. So his, uh, his, just his, let's just say his action movies, his thrill, his thrill movies, like spectacles, <laughs> his spectacles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that when you look at, uh, Jaws and, um, even though Close Encounters is a little more personal or personal or Indiana Jones, like those fucking work. Um, when he tries to get more emotional, I'm thinking color purple, always, um, uh, Amistad, even Schindler's List. Um, I feel like those don't land for me the way that like his just exciting stuff does. Um, because I, I think that, I don't know. I don't think it's what his, I don't think that's what his big bag is. I think his big bag is, you know, when I, his most, what he's best at is making great looking movies that just make you go, holy shit. You know, and when he tries, it's kind of like how I feel about Christopher Nolan. It's like when he's making fucking Batman, great. When he's making Interstellar, fuck off. You know, I don't <laughs> care about the father daughter relationship. Okay. Cause you don't have a soul, Christopher Nolan. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> well, what That's I'm saying, extreme, what I mean is yeah. he does have a yeah. soul. What I mean is he doesn't, he doesn't do emotion, you know? Yeah. So. But I oh. don't agree with you about, not about Christopher Nolan. I don't care about Christopher Nolan, although I do love yeah. some of his movies. But I don't agree with you about the spectacle movies. Like, I know what you're saying, and that is really his wheelhouse, and that's and where he's he shines. Got, and don't get me wrong. I'm going to yeah, interrupt you but, for a second. Those uh, do have personal moments in them, right, like Close but Encounters. But that's what I mean, is that if you look at every single one of his spectacle films, all of the big budget tentpole films, they yeah. do all have those really intense core themes throughout all of his films. They have those really, really, really personal moments. So I think that, so I think that's what's so fascinating is that when he's dealing with just emotions kind of on display, because like always, yeah, not a good film, but like when he's dealing with certain emotions just kind of on display, maybe it's not as effective, but when he's dealing with emotions combined with I agree the big with you. spectacle, totally. that's when it works. Totally. That's when he's like firing on all thrusters. I, I absolutely agree. I feel like there's something within like the big effects and the yeah. spectacle and the camera movements that just yes. somehow he naturally imbues his personal feelings into it through yes. the camera work and the actors, et cetera, et cetera. And he's really, really good at that. Yeah. He needs um, that dynamism. Yeah, exactly. I think when he's trying to do things in a little bit more quiet way, let's just say for him, I, I think that it it just doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't land for me most of the time. Um, Always is a bad film. <laughs> I, have, I have not seen that one. Oh, oh, Although so I am bad. thinking a lot about Bridge of Spies right now, which is basically just a movie of people in rooms talking. And I think Ooh, Spielberg I knocks it out of the park there. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, see, I haven't seen Bridge of Spies. You, I need to yeah, see it. Yeah. You've told me for years that that's one of your like favorite right. movies of his. So Yeah, and I um, also think that Color Purple is a good movie, although it should have been directed by a black woman, but that's a whole other story. And I actually think Schindler's List is a good movie too. I mean, I know- I don't think Schindler's List is a bad movie. I just yeah. think that- that Schindler's List, I, I don't have the reverence for it that most people do. Yeah, that's fair. That's totally yeah. fair, and I understand that. But yeah, now I want to watch Bridges by Zebin. So I also don't have the up. reverence for Jurassic Park that most people what? do. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But that's, whoa. Right. that's now, we're getting, I, I, now we're getting out of control. That's not actually <laughs> Slow that's not specifically, down. Pump that's the not specifically <laughs> about Spielberg. That's about, like, I don't like Michael Crichton. I never have. Um, and I also, I don't. Like dinosaurs, I've never been interested ever as a kid, as an adolescent, as an adult. I just don't give a shit about dinosaurs. Don't care. So that movie's just not going to work for me, it, no matter how cool the T Rex still looks 29 years later. You know? And it does. And it does look good, <laughs> but who cares? Oh, me, Wayne Knight me, gets me, eaten. I you know? Me, I care. I care about Laura Dern, the scientist, as Ellie. I love it. I like Sam Neill and Laura Dern. I love, I love Sam Neill. You know? I'm here for it. Give me, but, give me Jurassic um, Park all day, every day. <laughs> but I, but I, but I do, I totally agree with you, Megan, that, that when he's the, the emotion and like rah, rah or whatever mm-hmm. we want to call it together, he's just, he's great. Yeah. But you know, the quieter in air quotes <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So. Although I don't know, I think about, although arguably maybe it's a spectacle too. I think about AI, which is, I think one of his best See, films I've, and I've never I, seen AI. Me neither. It's, a, it's an amazing film. Um, I remember when it came out, it was very contentious, though, because um, a lot of people yeah. didn't like it. But one of those that has, throughout the years, critics have been much kinder to it. And it has, it, yeah, it's it's an amazing film. It's really fantastic. But it's arguably quieter, but it also has a ton of spectacle and visual effects to it, too. So, yeah. I, I have a question Maybe for that's you. that's why it works. Is yes. history ever going to be kind to the terminal? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's a good question. Uh. Well, Good do we question. have any closing parting thoughts about the the Fablemans? I really like the scene between Sammy and Seth Rogen when Sammy's really angry with him mm. about the affair mm-hmm. and and Seth Rogen has bought him a camera and he's like, don't be mad at your mother. Um, and he says it in a very tender, gentle way and he talks about how he loves him. And it's just, I think it's a very lovely scene. And so, and I'm so glad you brought up that you liked Seth Rogen's performance, Dave, because I agree with yeah. you. I think when Seth Rogen does dramatic roles, I tend to yeah. like that much he more than quite, his comedic roles. quite fine and yeah. undervalued as a dramatic actor. I agree with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I liked this. Oh, and I also agree with you too, both of you, that the behind the scenes filmmaking is really exciting to see. And I think it's it's done exceptionally well. Cause usually when you see kind of behind the scenes filmmaking, it's like, oh, whatever, who cares? But no, I think it's done, it's it's really vivacious and done incredibly well here. Yeah. You know what I loved watching when he was editing his movies, watching him edit on a moviola, because I have done that so much. Oh, that's so and cool. Just be like, oh my God, the moviola. You know, well, there's something to be said about like having the physical product in your hand, you know, mm-hmm. when you're actually physically cutting film. It's much different from uh, digital filmmaking. But anyway, that's a whole, that's another essay for another time. So um, <laughs> how about if we uh, move on to women talking? This is um, Sarah Polly's first movie as a writer-director in 10 years, which I didn't realize. Yeah. Um, that documentary that she made about her family came out in mm-hmm. 2012, yeah, which is mind blowing how fucking fast time flies. Anyway, uh, so this is written and directed by Sarah Polly, uh, based on Miriam Toe's novel. And here's your, uh, one, two, three, four sentence IMDb summary. Um, do nothing, stay and fight or leave. In 2010, the women of an isolated religious community grapple with reconciling a brutal reality with their faith. It's underselling it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So no kidding. Yeah, this stars uh, Rooney Mara, Judith Ivy, who I think is fucking fantastic in this. I'll just yep. say that right now. Claire Foy, who's great, also cameo from Francis McDormand. Ben Winshaw, uh, Wishaw is in this. Uh, one of the few men who actually has, a, I think, maybe the only man who has a speaking part in this. I'm not sure. Um, but basically, this uh, the short version is women talking is about, like it says in the short summary, an isolated 
religious community where the women are basically property. Um, they're not taught to read or write. Um, and there is a series of sexual assaults that are so gruesome, um, largely, you know, not on screen, but mostly like aftermath kind of stuff. But even the aftermath stuff is just really horrifying. The, the men in this community are drugging the women and assaulting them in all manners in the middle of the night. And uh, I think it's Claire Foy's character. Oh, no. One of the kids like sees one of the men running out of the house. Yes. And then they catch that man and he confesses and says all and names all the other men who are doing it. And then uh, the men want, they're arrested. And as it says in the voiceover, because the vo- it's narrated by, is it um, uh, Rooney Mara's daughter? Jesse Buckley's. Jesse Buckley's daughter. She says, you know, the men were removed and, and taken to the local jail uh, for their safety, you know. Um, and so the men give the women, you know, a choice. You can either forgive us and everything will go back to normal when we get out of jail or you have to leave. And so the movie is largely um, the women debating what they're going to do. And the three choices they come up with are forgive and have the men come back and everybody stays, stay and fight, which is an interesting road and, Mm -hmm. um, and leave. Those are the three choices they come up with. And um, I've always really liked Sarah Polly as a filmmaker. And I think I I thought this was fantastic. I don't know uh, about you two, but um, I just, uh, I just saw it today. So I'm still kind of thinking about it. Um, why don't one of you start <laughs> with with this? Because I'm just kind of still. Like, Ooh. But one thing that did stick out from me, two things stuck out to me, and one I'll talk about later. But the first is, um, I could not. I mean, I've always liked uh, Claire Foy, and I've always liked Judith Ivy. But the two of them are fucking unreal, amazing in this movie. It's just uh, Sheila McCarthy is really good. Um, mm-hmm that scene with her dentures where she apologizes for the dentures and then you find out why it's just like, it's such, it's like I've said heartbreaking at least twice in this episode so far. It's so Mm -hmm. heartbreaking and awful. Anyway, one of you do do better than I am. (laughs) I mean, I love this. This is in my top 10 films of the year. So um, I've seen this twice and it's one of those films that I wasn't sure if I was going to, because I was really struck by it when I saw it and I saw it about, a month, month ago, month and a half ago. And I was like, you know, maybe it was just one of those experiences where when I first saw it, it strikes you, but nope, I rewatched it and nope, still destroyed me emotionally. I was still crying by the end. Um, yeah, this is an incredibly powerful film. It's incredibly, it's, it's a staggeringly good cast. It's, it's mm-hmm. well written. It's well directed. The score is gorgeous. I love the score, and mm. I never can pronounce yeah. the composer's name. It's Hilder Guana de Tier, and she's an amazing composer. And I, there was an interview where she talked about how she was so angry reading about this because this is based on a real case of Mennonite women who were in a community um, in Bolivia, and this happened. And uh-huh. she was so angry reading about this that she channeled all of her rage into the... Well, first she thought she couldn't do the score and then she channeled all of her rage into it. But what ended up coming out was not an angry score, but instead she talked about a very hopeful score. And I love the very plaintive strings. And then when you see the moments of the flashbacks of that are very horrifying where there's blood, um, mm-hmm. it, it often has like this gonging bell. And I really... I, one of the things I really really appreciated in this film and this is a very thoughtful film is that you don't see the rapes you don't see the assaults you see the aftermath of them you see the impact you hear about the impact you hear about how Mm -hmm. one one woman committed suicide you hear about you know all how how they're all dealing with this trauma and it's very clear they're all running the gamut of emotions you know like Claire Foy is just a ball of rage and just full on 
fury. And then Jesse Buckley is like, no, we should forgive. But her anger is very, not very well concealed. And she's like mm. snapping at everyone. And then you have Rooney Mara, who's very calm, very gentle, and has kind of, you know, taken this as a moment to catalyze their, you know, collective choices and what and what possibilities there could be for their future and their community. And it's just it's just really beautiful to see them all come together, to see the way they discuss trauma, to hear the narration by the girl, um, Jesse Buckley's daughter, talking about how they don't have a language for this and in not having a language for what happened to their bodies is the real horror. And just all of these really important themes of power dynamics and sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, and toxic masculinity. And Ben Wisha is so incredible as August. He is just this very gentle soul who is trying to help the women as much as possible without being intrusive. And mm -hmm. he's very much in love with Ona, Rudy Mara's character. And, but he's very respectful of all the women. It's just, it's a very lovely depiction to see. But I also love that he's not the only man in the film with a speaking role. We also have Melvin, the trans man, oh, yeah. who is played by a non binary actor. And Melvin doesn't speak except to the children, but he does speak at the very end. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really fascinating too. Like, it's kind of, at first, it's kind of disturbing because two of the two of the young women misgender him and they dead name him. But then I'm also like, would they not? They you know they probably don't understand trans people. But then mm -hmm. what I love is at the end of the film, one of the women says, "Thank you, Melvin," and it's just like, oh, it's it's just it's it's great to see. So we're seeing two men who are very different depictions of masculinity than the toxic masculinity of the rapists and the abusers and those who are enabling the abuse. So I just think this is a fantastic, stunning, powerful film. Mm. Yeah. Evan, how about you? Uh, I would say I'm in the same boat. This was uh really well written, well directed. Um, I just was very, I was just very impressed by the performances in the film, the chemistry of the actors, the way that this film plays with the space of the, um, the barn that they're in while they're having this debate. Yeah. The, um, as you were just talking about Megan, the perform Ben Wishaw gives a really great performance in this, a very quiet subdued. I mean, he's not normally like a, like a loud, large presence <laughs> in things, no. but you know, his kind of very, uh, pared down, very like kind of <laughs> meek performance works extremely well here for this, guy who is very sympathetic and uh he i mean he even butts in once in a way that the other the women feel is inappropriate and they're like hey don't do that and then later on when they're like all kind of sitting around and they're like oh what do you think and he's he's like you know what it, it's not important like i had a thought it's not important it doesn't matter like keep talking like i'm here for support but I'll ultimately like my voice doesn't need to be heard here and so i like that a lot i think just a really solid movie. Um, to me, it felt a little slow in places, but overall, like it's, it's just really compelling. Uh, and you know, for a movie of people mostly sitting in a room talking, <laughs> there's some pretty intense conversations. It's an apt title <laughs> that mine a lot yeah. of uh, you know really deep themes. And you know, you're making the point, Megan, that I think it does a really good job of integrating the traumatic piece without, you know, showing you gruesome details. It's really focused yeah. on the women mm -hmm. and how they're reacting to those situations, like the way they're waking up in the bed with the blood or there's one, I think one person's like smearing the blood on the wall. And mm -hmm. so it's very tastefully done. And so I found that really respectable and all their performances were great. I mean, I really liked Sheila McCarthy a lot in this. Yeah. I love yes. that she was always telling stories the about horses. Her horses. Oh my God. It's <laughs> amazing. Were like, Un yeah. Enough about the horses already. Um, <laughs> but they all, all those stories made sense though, in context, you know, yeah, they did. They, yeah, they, they did. did. They did. So I really liked her in this. I've liked her in other things. I thought she was great in anything for Jackson, which was quite a fun oh horror God. movie. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, um, she was also in a movie I saw recently called Cardinals that I think she was really good in. 
And so I was just excited to see her here. And I think, I don't know, everybody's great. I don't really, I don't really have anything bad to say about this movie. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. It's really impressive uh, writing and directing from Sarah Polly and really Mm -hmm. compelling emotional story. And there's just such palpable tension throughout where they are really, they have a ticking clock Mm -hmm. that they need to, if they're going to leave, they need to leave soon. Before the men come back. And so I found myself really on edge toward the end of the film, like, you know, yelling at characters on, you could go, go, you got to go, just get yourself and go. Like, don't linger. (laughs) Stop (laughs) wasting time. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I was like, just move, just move, just keep going, just leave. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I kept being terrified that like somebody was going to show up and stop them. Like, right. I did too. You don't expect that level of tension going into a movie called Women Talking. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah i kept wondering like what's going to happen if the men arrive before they leave but mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. they they do leave before all of the men get back i just wanted to say before i forget the fact that you that you were talking about the title women talking when you when i searched a gif and yes i say gif not jif when you search a gif on twitter <laughs> for women talking and i was looking for gifts for the movie uh, the amount of gifts that are like men going like dit, 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 like mocking women talking is obscene. And I think that that's a really fascinating point that, you know, we're like, oh, you wouldn't expect that level of tension from just women talking. But that is that is kind of the point. And that is mm-hmm. I think it's an it's like an unassuming title even though that is exactly it's descriptive of what's happening, which Dave, you just said not that long ago. Yeah. But I think it is it is so important. And because, you know, conversations are so important because, and if they just stay conversations, maybe not. But the fact that they're catalyzing change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. And, and that's right. what's so, that's the crux of this. And that's what's so important. And so I think it's just the way it all comes together is just brilliant. But Dave, yes. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, I say. think... Uh, piggybacking off your talking about the title, I think that it works on a couple levels. You know, you've got women talking, which is just exactly what it is. But then you have the sort of subtext of, are we talking or are we taking action? What are we, right. what are we doing? Right. And ultimately, you know, they, they take action. Um, I think, I think they all leave except for Francis McDormand. Right. I mean, yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I just, you know, this was surprisingly, I mean, I kind of knew what it was about going in. I try not to, uh, like you, Megan, I try not to read up too much about what I'm going to see. All I knew that it was, it was Sarah Polly and I, I've liked, I, I liked her when she still acted. I like mm-hmm. her as a writer director. I think she's fucking great. Um, and so I knew that I was probably, unless it was like a total misfire, I was probably going to be on board. Um, and I was totally on board, but I mean, this was hard to watch. You know, just mm-hmm. hearing the you, you, this this movie does a really uh, almost profound job of navigating the um, the complicated roots of human emotions, <laughs> you know, and how mm-hmm. one person can feel five or six different ways about the same thing, um, yeah. or how. Um, Everybody sort of gives Jesse Buckley, who is also fantastic, I should single her out too, how everybody kind of gives her room to be an asshole because they know inherently that there's something tearing at her underneath that she's not ready to address. And I also am fascinated, by the way, how they make a point of saying that none of these women can read or write, at least not very well, but they are... Re- they're all at least the women doing the debating in the barn doing the talking they're all brilliant you know borderline brilliant they all know themselves in their community inside out um mm-hmm. and they are all aware of what their roles are but it seems like this is the first time it's all coming everything's being laid on the table and to just sort of watch that dynamic play out and to watch the mothers and like you know, Angela McCarthy is Jesse Buckley's mother in in the movie. I hope I'm getting all the names right. Um, and to like watch their dynamic because you have Mary Kay, is that Jesse Buckley's name? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then her mother with the horses. <laughs> 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 Sheila McCarthy, excuse me, I got her name wrong before. She's Greta. And to just watch their dynamic 
and how Greta goes out of her way to say I'm so you know to to apologize to her daughter for for these things and she's and she's just like mom don't you know I'm I'm being more <laughs> contemporary about the language but I also like by the way how she she tells someone to fuck off but she says fuck it off and then one of the little girls is like I think the phrase is fuck off <laughs> I just <laughs> thought that was great yeah I I don't know I just thought the the dynamics between all of the 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 characters um, were really, they were very true to real life in terms mm-hmm. of not the specific, um, ha- the specific story, but the, the emotions that, that the gamut of emotions that people can run even in like an afternoon and times 10 or however many, when you're dealing with not just one traumatic event, but a whole series of traumatic events. And then if you think about it, a traumatic life, yeah, you know, for for you know what they've had to live through and how they are they basically they they they're just they're just there to serve one purpose for these men which is to the polite way would be to say to just serve them and to be and to be made to fear them and what will happen i we i forgot to mention that one of the things about the women leaving is that the men have told them if you leave you will be not denied entrance to the kingdom of heaven Mm-hmm. And it's just like, holy, I mean, I don't believe in any of that shit, but if I did, what a Trump card to hold, you know? Mm-hmm. And if you're dealing with a society in which you have never had any power and the people who do hold the power are like, you know, if you do this, mm? so on top of everything else, these women, <laughs> you know, they decide I don't fear hell. <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, and I'm just, you know, none of this is light. This is all very, um, it's all very dramatic with moments of humor. And I also like that line in the voiceover that, uh, Jesse Buckley's daughter says, sometimes I feel like people laugh so hard, but they really want to cry or it's something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, or they there's not much hard. different. They, yeah, they laugh, laugh as, as hard, hard as they would cry. Yeah. Yeah. It's so great. And I was just like, that is, I mean, I, I think he kind of nailed like humans, <laughs> like in one sentence right there. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, I just thought this was amazing. I wish I'd seen it before we voted. Um, I just, I hadn't, there were just so many goddamn movies to see. And I was just <laughs> only going so many hours them. in a day. <laughs> I was going through them. I didn't do any sorting. I wasn't like, this one's more important. I'll watch this. It was just like, whatever order it came in in the mail is how it, and this was like the movie that came first. So it was on the bottom of the pile because I just oh, piled everything up. Yeah. I should have told you to hurry up and watch it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. yeah. I should have told you know, to watch get the on fucking it. Fablemans. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh, the poor Fablemans. <laughs> yeah. Poor. <You> know- <laughs> Poor misunderstood fablements. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. But, you know, <laughs> the thing that I, you know, and what we're talking about, because Dave, what you were saying really reminded me of this. You're, we're talking about the heaviness and the intensity of what they're dealing with and what these conversations are about. And, you know, there have been, especially post Me Too, um, there have been so many films dealing with sexual harassment, rape, um, so many horrific situations that women and non-binary people deal with and some have done it exceptionally well and some have really not but it's not even a new thing because I mean we've been dealing there's there's the whole rape revenge subgenre and horror and so often when there's something traumatic that happens the fixation is on vengeance the fixation is on retaliation and I think that that is what is done so beautifully here is that it's talked about, it's part of the discourse, but that's not really where the focus lies. The focus lies on what kind of a world do we want for our children? What kind of a world do we want for ourselves? How can we heal? How can we come together? How do we sit with this pain and work through it? And that is so... I have said this on multiple episodes that I wish there were more trauma-informed writers directors and films, 
this is coming from a very trauma informed place and somebody or multiple people, Sarah Polly and like, it's very clear to me that there was research done or discussions done or experience with dealing with some kind of trauma therapy because it is done so exceptionally well. And it's just really refreshing to see a film that is dealing with all of these issues on such an individual basis, but also something that is such a systemic problem in Mm. our society. Agreed. Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. What a light way to end an episode, unless anybody has (laughs) anything they want (laughs) to... drop at the end here evan do you have any final thoughts i think the only other thing is that i i think it's interesting that this film takes place in 2010 because but for really the census guy coming and telling you it's 2010 you don't really know but i think once you learn that it's 2010 i feel like it makes this all the more troubling not to say that the outside world the quote-unquote modern world is perfect by any means but it, to me, it seems scary that communities could live in such an isolated way where these women are, you know, held captive by the fact that they can't get education and they live in this community where people just can abuse them freely. And it's so, I don't know, to me, it just added a level of disturbingness to the proceedings that made the, the ele- elevated the discussion that much more. I'm actually really glad that you brought that up because I think it works on multiple levels because the reason the film takes place in 2010 is because the situation that happened in Bolivia that Miriam Taves was writing about in her novel, she's also an ex-Mennonite, but not in that community. Um, She was in a different community, I think, in Canada. But that situation in Bolivia took place between the women were raped between 2005 and 2009. So I think that's why it takes place in 2010. But you're right. Mm -hmm. Even if you didn't know that, like taking that out of it, it does work on that that level of being even more removed than we are today. And so even though it's only, you know, 12 years ago. But yeah, great point. I'm so glad you brought that up, Evan. Thanks. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) i I don't have anything profound to add sorry um yeah i will we're all bringing something amazing to the table there we are (laughs) um yeah the only thing that i could have done with that and this is the monkeys but whatever it's fine you know daydream believer has its place i guess so i'm joking (laughs) i was like i'm joking it didn't bother me at all like, you mean I like actually, the animals? I was yeah. for a minute. I was like, "Wait, what?" Because I'm thinking of monkeys there from the Fable Men. <laughs> Fable yeah. Men, right? Yeah, yeah. No, but the song "The Monkeys." No, I like the monkeys. So, <laughs> no the uh, the song "Daydream." Believe the the version yes. that the monkeys did is is very prominent in um in a couple places in yes. uh, women talking. So, so if you're not kind a fan of, of jarringly Peter's so, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway. So uh, let's recap real quick. The Fablemans, which is out now. Uh, yay or nay? I'm a yay. yay. I'm a nay with your mileage may vary. <laughs> um, it's not a hard yet, nay. But, you know. And it sounds like we have um, about women talking, which comes out today, Friday. Uh, it sounds like we have three yays. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that is quite cool that we were able to... Uh, come together so so nicely on well I, this is a good conversation about the fablements too i mean i guess if i had to guess you two probably aren't surprised by how i felt about the fablements no <laughs> yeah. no not really <laughs> yeah all right well everyone um that does it for this week's episode of spoiler piece theater i want to thank our editor Otto clamor thank you so much Otto, for uh making us sound great every week it really means a lot to us thanks, thanks Otto. Otto. You can find Spoiler Peace Theater anywhere you can get podcasts. You can find us on our website, spoilerpeace.com. You want to find us on social media. We're Spoiler Peace Theater on Facebook, and we're at Spoiler Peace on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. You can email us, that's spoilerpeace at gmail.com, if you wanted to get in touch and share your feelings about, well, no, why The Fablemans is truly the most amazing Steven Spielberg film ever, uh, Dave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us uh, another way, you can give us a call. At 86221 peace. Leave us a voice of a, a vice mail. I don't know what's wrong with me. Leave us a voicemail. Uh, let us know what you think about this show, about previous shows, about, uh, you know, 
Patreon kind of stuff, we'd love to hear from you. If you like the show, please rate and review us by going to ratethispodcast.com slash spoiler piece, or you can rate us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. That really helps get the word out whenever we get rated um, or people leave a comment. And if you really, really like the show, please consider joining our Patreon. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, we talk about the Hallmark movie, Hanukkah on Rye, um, a rom-com in the Hallmark tradition with a Jewish theme, and uh, it's a great, lively conversation. And I, I think I think you'd all be doing yourself a great thing if you got yourself a Hanukkah or Christmas gift of a Patreon subscription to Spoiler Piece Theater <laughs> yeah. to hear the 300-ish episodes that are sitting over there waiting for your listening pleasure. Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, that's that. My name is Dave Riedel. I write and I talk about movies. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And if you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Dave Sees Movies on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. My name is Evan Crean. I'm co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as Real Recon, and that's real as in film reel. And my name is Megan Kearns. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network. I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and a member of Gallica. You can follow me on Twitter at Opinioness World or on Instagram and Letterboxd at The Opinioness. And that's everything, everybody. Thanks. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.